So let's open up our hearts and believe God that as he speaks, we will hear as he learned. And that his will will be done and is done among us today as it is in heaven. Say this with me. Father, I thank you that your will is done in me here today as you have ordained it, ordered it in heaven. It is done. I receive it. My ears are open to hear your voice for your utterance. My heart is receptive to your truth. My will is set. I will hear your voice. I will receive your word. I will mix your truth with faith and liberty and freedom. That's the results. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing that breaks yokes, that removes burdens, that anchors me in my oneness with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have a seat. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory, glory, hallelujah. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let all the people praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let the saints rejoice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because we believe to see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. They that believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Because they believe, they rejoice. Amen. And they shout for joy. Luke chapter 10 verse 1. After these things the Lord appointed another 70 also. And he sent them out. Two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. So there is an assignment in our life wherever we go. We are basically to prepare the way of the Lord. Wherever we go, we are expecting God to show up. Amen? Which ought to make sense because wherever we are, he is. So he sent them before his face into every city whithersoever he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, it's plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, the one who knows how to bring in the harvest and put in the sickle, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Turn with me to John chapter 4. We're talking about the harvest of the Lord. And we're talking about fruits to harvest souls. John chapter 4 and verse 25, verse 35. Jesus says, say not, say not ye. So don't say this. There are yet four months and then come at harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. For they are white already to harvest. Lift up your eyes, look on the field, they are ripe, they are ready to harvest. And then he goes on to say, He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. He that reapeth receiveth wages. Now I want us to have a singular focus and recognize that we are inhabited by the Lord who is the Lord of the harvest, that his very life and nature within us, he who is in us knows how to reach people. He knows how to touch people, how to affect people. He knows how to cause every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that he is Lord. 
He knows how to save to the uttermost all them that come unto the Father by him. He is the Savior. And therefore, we are coming into an alignment with the truth that he is in us and that it is his life that we live. And we want to allow him to flow through us and bring in the harvest. But as we have that singular mindset of thinking, I want you to know that because you see the devil is a deceiver. And he has a spirit of offense that he tries to work in us. To bring us into a place where we are so concerned about what is in it for me. That we cannot surrender to that singular focus that it's about the harvest. And it's about people. And it's about reaching other souls. So I want to quiet, I want to silence him and, and break the power of his deception just for a moment. You see, he deceived Eve thinking that if, if she was to go ahead and pick this fruit, she's going to be like God. Not recognizing that she was already like God. Amen? So he would like to deceive us to think that if you go pursuing the harvest, then you and your needs are not going to be met. But that's a deception because the truth of the matter is, when you seek first the kingdom of God and you have that singular pursuit, what happens? Everything else gets added onto you. And the Bible says, he that winneth souls is what? Wise. You cannot serve the Lord and do the will of God and, and your needs end up being neglected. It's an impossibility. Are you with me? So to have this singular focus is the very best thing you can do is, is, is a very key to your own prosperity. The Bible says as long as they sought the Lord, the Lord caused them to prosper. So here in this passage, Jesus says something very interesting here in John chapter 4. He says, don't say four months and then come to the harvest, but lift up your eyes. Behold, check it out. Look, you will see that the harvest, it is ripe. It's in the field and it's ready. They are white. They are ready to harvest. And he that reap it, receive it what? Receive it what? Wages. Say wages. Come on, it's not a bad word. Wages. He that, he that reap it, receive it wages. You would say, well, how could that be? My region souls and I'm receiving wages? I'm telling you, the early church had no lack. The Bible says there was none that lacked among them. Did it say that? Amen? And it was all because there were people being saved daily. And, all right? and they were daily in the house of God. And the Lord was adding to them daily. And what happened? Finances came into the church. So it is that as you pursue with a singular focus the will of God, causing it to be on earth as it is in heaven, causing that life that is in you to flow through you, being in submission and in, and in yieldingness and in abandonment to him, you cannot help but prosper. Amen? Oh, that it would hearken unto me. Then would I have made their prosperity as the waves of the sea. It would keep on coming. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17 and 18. I believe it is. Or 18 and 19. I will teach you the prophet. Amen? Hallelujah. So, even as we are going... So, what the thing is, in our words, here we are, we're going to talk about reaching souls, but in the midst of it, God is meeting your needs. While you're out there on the battlefield, he's taking care of stuff at home. Are you with me? It is an amazing thing. Even in the midst of it all, you've got situations that in the time of receiving this word, you lay those situ situations aside, you cast all those cares aside because you know he cares for you and you have a confidence in, him, in his care and his love that you cast everything else aside. But even as you cast them aside, in the midst of the message, he gives you an utterance. He speaks to you. He directs you. He builds your faith. And he speaks to a situation in your life. That is the amazing power of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tell me the first John chapter 4. Now, there are some things we need to know and have a clear understanding of as we pursue the harvest of the Lord and as we endeavor to allow the Spirit of God and Christ himself to flow to us and touch people and reach people. 
It says in first, and so we're going to talk about some of those things you need to know. First John 4, 17, it says, here is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. When love is perfected in us, it flushes fear out. It drives it out. Perfect love drives out fear. Because you see, fear has torment. And God don't want you tormented. And when there is an element of torment that is manifesting, fear is present. And the love of God needs to be perfected. Let me make a slight shift just for a moment. There is a principle in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. In Luke chapter 11, you don't need to turn to it. I'm just, this has come up, so I'm giving it to you. In Luke chapter 11, it, uh, it says um, that when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he, this is in Luke chapter 11, verse 24. You can write it down, check it out later. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through men through dry places. That unclean spirit might be fear. That unclean spirit might be anxiety. It might be worry. It might be whatever it is. It might not be some demonic um, spirit of, 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 of suicide or, or, um, or, or, or something else like that. It might not be a demonic um, possession of, of some occultic nature. It might, it might be fear, and I shouldn't say just fear because fear is big. It might be anxiety, it might be worry, it might be whatever it is. But when that unclean spirit has gone out of the man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. And he said, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished, nice and clean. But then he goes, but he finds it nice, clean, but empty. So he goes and he takes to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. That's a tremendous statement. But you see, we take that statement and we, 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 come, we think of it in terms of somebody that gets delivered at the altar. Some demon possession and they get delivered. So now, um, you know, they got to get filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues or else the devil is going to come back ten, seven times over. And it does apply there. But it applies in other areas. There, the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. The Bible says that when you, when you come to a certain place of understanding and revelation, if you allow yourself to drop from that place and go back down to a lower place, you become vulnerable. For instance, I know one person that got healed miraculously in a particular, physically, of a physical a severe, actually lupus. But then what happened is, after they got healed, I mean totally, completely healed, verified by, by the doctors and everything else, conceived twins when they were never supposed to conceive again and so on, but then what happened, they went back into an area that preached unbelief. And then down the road, a worse, something else came on them. And I've seen that so many times. But it's not only in this, like I've seen somebody, I've seen, and I know of situations like this, someone might, might be in a church where they're speaking in tongues, the Holy Ghost is moving, and these things are happening. But then somewhere along the line, something happens. Maybe Maybe somebody in the congregation offend them. Maybe the, the preacher offend them. Something happened. They get hurt, whatever the case is. And so they decide, I'm going to leave that environment of speaking in tongues of the Holy Ghost and all that excitement. And they decide, and so now they go back into some denominational setting where there is no tongues, there is no Holy Ghost. right? And they feel comfort hiding in that arena. And it's a hiding involved here. But anyway, what happened is, and then as time go by, when you check them out later, they're in bondage. What happens? Because God gave them, bring them to a certain place of understanding. And as Paul said in um, Philippians, that you need to at least maintain the place that, to which God has brought you. But so it is in other areas. Fear. You can, you can come to the altar today, we can lay hands on you, rebuke fear, take authority over fear, and that spirit of fear has to leave you. But then what happened 
three weeks later, two months later, four weeks, um, sometime later, if you don't replace that fear with what? What should you replace it with? With the knowledge of the fact that God loves you. You follow me? If that fear is not replaced with the knowledge of the love of God and his love for you, somewhere down the road, that fear is going to come back. Are you with me? The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. How do you do that? Just an act of your will. You take your cares, your anxieties, and you say, Jesus, this don't belong to me. I'm not going to be anxious about anything. I cast all this care upon you. Amen? Isn't that right? But any of you do not also develop in the knowledge of the fact that he cared for you and his love for you, then it's just a matter of time, and that care is going to come back. Are you with me? And so it is with many other things. That just came up. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. It's okay. Just accept it. Amen? Are you with me? So you get rid of something. Thank God for it, but replace it. Replace it with the truth from the sacrifices of Christ and the word of God. All right. Anyway, let's get back. 1 John 4, 17. So here is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The love is made perfect that we might have boldness in the day of of judgment. For as he is, so are we in this world. And I, and I was paraphrasing this verse. Here is love made perfect. And we know that perfect love casts out fear. Isn't that right? So here is love made perfect. And so that no fear is there. No self-consciousness is there. Because where there is self-consciousness and you are so much aware of you as you are in, in, your, in the flesh... Fear is, it doesn't matter, fear it has a, and the enemy has an open door. But when this love is perfected, and there is no fear, there is no self-consciousness, there is no insecurity, but rather, what is there? There is boldness. It says, here is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. There is boldness, which doesn't mean shouting and screaming, but there's a plainness of speech. There is no intimidation from anyone or anything at any time. The day of judgment could be any time. Amen? Why is that? Because we have come to this realization. We have come to this revelation. We have come to this consciousness. What consciousness? As he is, so are we in this world. We've come to that consciousness that as he is, so are we. I'm not seeing me. I'm seeing him in me. I am recognizing that I am crucified with him. And it is no longer I that live. But it is Christ that liveth in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Are you with me? That is my consciousness. And that makes all the difference. So as we pursue this harvest... It is the Lord within us, his life in us, Christ in us, that is able to touch people's lives and bring that deliverance. But we must have the identity in that you, you, your identity needs to be that it's him in you that is flowing through you and that you are, he's flowing through you, you are his vessel. You are his harvesting tool or instrument. You've got to have that concept. You got to have that consciousness. It's not me. It's not about me. And it's not me. It's him and me that needs to flow. You must also understand and, and get this. He that is in you, which is Christ. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 7. Let's look at scriptures today. Amen. It might slow us down, but I'll tell you something. When you get your eyes on it and you hear it coming in in your ears and you're speaking it out of your mouth, then it can get lodged in your heart. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7. You see, the whole thing about being established in righteousness is to be so anchored in this reality of the oneness that you have with God in Christ. It is to be so anchored in that oneness that you cannot even conceive of any separation between you and him. You cannot, there is no disconnect in your thinking between you and him. Amen? And when you are, and as you are, I, 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 and because... Religion, whether it be in the singing or in the teaching, creates a separation. 
Where Jesus and God is off there and it's me and it's him as opposed to me and him lost in him, my life here with Christ and God. That's not the reality of religion. And, and if that's not, if the, and that's why religion is not the truth. It is not the gospel. And it is not what God has for us. Because the truth is, it's Christ in you. And so because we have that separation mindset, we think that I must win the world. That it is, that we think that it is us winning the souls. No, it's not you. It's you must yield to him and let him flow through you. And he is able to make every knee bow and every tongue confess his lordship. Are you with me? Salvation is of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 7 verse, verse 24 says, This man, Jesus, he continued forever. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, because of that, he is able. Hmm. He is able. That word able, you know, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. And there are many other places where the word able is there. That word able means he has the power and the ability to do and to perform, but there is a condition. That word able means that he can do it. He has the ability to do it, but it's not guaranteed that it will be done. You understand that? That's a very important, that's a very important point. He is able to do exceeding abundantly. He is able, means he got ability. However, there is some kind of condition involved here that could, that could stop that able. Amen? That could kill Abel. There's a cane that could mess up Abel. <laughs> anyway, that is came. I thought it was cute anyhow. <laughs> but he is Abel, which means if you don't cooperate with him, it can stop him. He is able to save them to the uttermost. That come unto God by him, seeing he ever live to make intercession for them. For such a high priest, for such a high priest became us. He became just like them. He knows how to reach them no matter who they are. Are you with me? He is able to save. He is able to reach them. Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Behold, check it out. The Lord's arm is not short that it cannot save. Nor is his ear deaf that he cannot hear. He that is in you is able to save. Um, Philippians 3, 21 says, He is able to subdue all things unto himself. Which means what? He is able to make that person bow and receive him. He can bring them to himself. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 says, He can, make every, he can cause every tongue to confess. What is the point? It is not by might nor by power, but it is what? By the Spirit. Except the Lord build the house, what happened? They live in vain. I am simply trying to say that here you are, you are his vessel, you are his vehicle, you are his instrument, you are a laborer together with him, you have his life, you have the one who is the Lord and master of the harvest living inside of you that want to flow through you. And he wants to reach people. Amen? But, he must be allowed to flow. He must be allowed to flow, which means you've got to get out of the way. John the Baptist said, he must increase and we must decrease. Paul says, I die daily. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10, uh, uh, um, he says, I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Christ might be made manifest. In other words, this life of Christ that is in me is not going to be made manifest if I don't actively, um, with, with a degree of understanding and faith and, and the fear of the Lord, if I do not bear about the dying of the Lord Jesus, if I do not identify with his death, if I do not identify with his death, then that life is not made manifest. In fact, that is the very key for your healing to show up. 
When you could identify that in his death he bore my sickness, he carried my infirmities, and by his stripes I'm healed. I agree with that truth. I commune with that truth. I, I agree with that, uh, with my mind, with my thinking, with my attitude, with my speech. Surely he bore my sicknesses and carried my infirmities. By his stripes I'm healed. No matter what the doctor's reports say, when I can do that, his life will be made manifest even in my mortal body. Amen? And that life can flow out of my spirit into my flesh. This here, where I might need it. You understand that? But for that life to flow out and touch somebody else, it takes the same thing. I have got to die daily. I've got to identify and recognize I'm crucified. It's no longer I, but it's Christ that liveth in me. The anointing, Christ that has to flow out of you, is the very anointing. Christ is the anointing. Christ in you, the anointing in you. And it must be allowed to flow. And it is that anointing, Christ himself, that is able to break the yokes off of people's lives. Open up their blinding eyes. Bring them out of their captivity, out of their bondages. Set the prisoners free. Bring the healing. Bring the deliverance. It is, it is Christ that is able to do it. When the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, this spake he of those that believe, it's talking about his life flowing out of us. Amen. But for that life to flow, blockages got to get out of the way. Amen. We already mentioned one of those blockages. You. <laughs> you need to get out of the way. You need to reckon yourself crucified. But then there is people. People. People are a blockage. The attitude and the mindset uh, and people in general are a blockage. People can intimidate you. People can affect you. Paul says, I was delivered from the people and from the Gentiles, and then God sent me to them to turn them. Acts 26, verse 17 and 18. And so in order to turn the people, you've got to be delivered from them. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, the love of Christ constrains me, and it brings me to this judgment and comprehension that when one died for all, they were all dead. So every human being was crucified in Christ. And if they're crucified, and I see them from where I am in Christ, where I'm crucified, and they're crucified, they have no effect on me, I have no effect on me, and for me to live is Christ. Amen? Amen? And I live for the will of God, not for, not for my will, not for the will of men. And because I'm in this place where I'm crucified, they're crucified, I am in him, I'm washed by the blood, he has paid the price for their sin. What happened? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16, I am able to not know them after the flesh, to not know them because of what they did. And because of the remembrance of what they did and didn't do. And because of what they say. And because of their hurts. Because of their afflictions and their assaults against me. I don't know them from that place. Because I don't know them after the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16. And so it says, I as a priest of God, I am called to reign through Christ. And the first thing it says about my reigning, and I'm referring to uh, Revelation chapter 5 verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. For the first thing it says about me as a king and a priest unto God, in terms of reigning through Christ, John chapter 20 and 23 says, I am to remit people's sins. I am to remit their sins. What for? For their sake? I have a blockage. I got to get rid of I got to get people off of me. The fact is Jesus already got them off of me when he crucified them. But I still have the deception in my mind that they are my problem. So I got to apply the truth, get rid of that deception, come in line with the truth and get them off of me, get me off of me, get them off of me, get situations and circumstances off of me, off of you. So I remit their sins for their sake, but I also remit their sins for my own sake, lest the devil gets an advantage on me. Amen? I don't want him to have an advantage. Like as I said in, in lawn tennis, when you have an advantage, when the enemy has an advantage, the next point, he wins the match. For those who don't know lawn tennis, you're going to have to do some Googling. <laughs> but believe me, that's how it works. I don't want to give the devil an advantage. And so that, so that that person or those people or that individual 
or situation doesn't become an open door to the enemy in my life so that that don't happen, I better remit their sins. You understand that? So that way I get rid. So, so people have been dealt with. Sin has been dealt with. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, I'm just going to mention this. It says, for he, in that he died, he died on the sin once. He did the same thing with sickness. He did the same thing with a curse. He did the same thing with poverty. That is why it is by his death, just by his death alone, I've got a lot of victory. For in that he died, he died on to sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth on to God. Now I was in him. All me and all of my sins, I was in him. And when he died to sins, he, he, that sin nature, he dealt with it. And so verse 11 says, likewise, the same way he died with that sin once and so on, likewise you are to record yourself to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. In other words, then my deliverance from sin is not going to become from my willpower. It's not going to become from my much praying as much as that will help. It's, and it's not, but where does it come from? It comes from this fact that this authority of his death that says he dealt with that sin nature. And when I could put the truth of the word of God in my mouth, Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, that says the world is crucified to me. What's the world? 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says in the world is what? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and what? Pride of life, which is not of the father, but is of the world. Amen? Does it say that? But what is all that? Is, is, is there any sin outside the lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life? No. But what is the deliverance? Galatians 6, 14. I will glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life have been crucified to me, and I unto it. And Romans 6, 11 says, I reckon myself dead. So you've got to declare that and speak it maybe thousands of times so as to break the power of that particular addiction, bondage, behavior, conduct off of your life. It's not just say, it's not just I think I can, I think I can, or it's not just some willpower thing. No. It is not you making, becoming determined. No. It is the power of the cross that ends it. The power of his death and the power of crucifixion. And then what about situations? Do you know situations could hinder you from reaching somebody? Do you know situations can clog up your mind? Do you know the situations can become such a blockage that even though here you are, full and pregnant with God and all of his fullness and the exceeding greatness of his power, the glory of God, the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, and all that power could be in the inside of you and not flow out of you. Why? Because they're blockages. And those blockages can come from yourself. It can come from people. It can come from sin. It can also come from situations. The Bible says, and this is a powerful scripture. You, may, you need to meditate on it. Colossians chapter 2. Just like Galatians 2.20, but this is Colossians 2.20. All right? That speaks about situations. And the power of crucifixion. You see, we have been taught to just take the promises, take the promises. And that's part of it. But we have come to a place of maturity where God wants, to, wants you to exercise in righteousness. And come to a place where even your senses can learn to discern between good and evil. The Bible says when we were little children, then we used to feed on milk. But when we become a man, we put away childish things and we begin to eat meat. What is the meat of the word? Exercising in righteousness. Exercising in this oneness that you have with God in Christ. Galatians, I mean Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13 and 14. Amen. Am I saying that the issue of mixing promises with faith and is, not, is, not, is not good? It is good. But come on. You're a little bit more grown up. We can't just try to just get the cookies that are on the lower shelf. Climb up to the top shelf. Get a ladder if you have to. You're not going to fall. Say I'm a big boy. I'm a big girl. I'm growing up. I could reach the top. <laughs> Hello? Righteousness. God says it is his desire that his children would be taught of the Lord and they would have great peace and wholeness and they would be established in righteousness. That's what he said. That's his desire. 
And his desire is not in vain. Where did I say go turn? Where did I say to turn? Come on, somebody help me. Colossians, yes. Colossians chapter 2. That's right. Situations, say situations. Have you, ever, have you ever had situations screaming at you? How do you shut them up? <laughs> because you see, when they're screaming at you, you can't hear the voice of God, and you need the voice of God for the wisdom of God. Amen? Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 says, now King James is kind of vague. Anyway, King James says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world... Are you subject to its ordinances? Touch not, taste not. But we get distracted by this touch not, taste not, handle not. We get distracted from the power of this verse because we get caught up on touch not, taste not, handle not. But, but what is it saying? If you be dead with Christ, are you dead with Christ? Is your life hid with Christ in God? Were you buried with him by baptism? And that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, were you also raised up? Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. If you be dead with Christ, they listen to the Amplified. If then you have died with Christ to material ways of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elementary notions and teachings of externalism, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to the rules and the regulations such as touch not, taste not? It is not telling you that you are to be rebellious to your boss. It is not tell to tell you that the, the, the stop sign says, the red light says stop. You decide, you know what, I'm not going to go by that rule. I'm going to drive through this life. It's not talking about that. But it is talking about those situations in, in life where the world want to want to deal with, how want to allow those situations to speak to them in a certain manner, and God says, "No, no, 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 you dead, you dead to it. You've been raised up above it. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Don't be affected by it. You affect it with the word of God, with the promises of God, with the truth of the sacrifice of what Jesus did. You declare unto that situation, you've got no voice to me. I silence you because I'm crucified to you through the body of Christ." Because when you do these things, what happens? You remove those blockages. Say, remove the blockages. Besides, on top of that, Colossians 1 verse 20 also says, concerning those situations, talking about the blood of Christ, what the blood has done. Having made peace. What's peace? Wholeness. Peace is wholeness, but peace is also... Um, Peace is, the, is also an enjoining. It is a reconciliation. Amen? So having made peace, having reconciled to it the blood of his cross, this is not what he's going to do. He's already done this. Say it's done. It's finished. And if it's finished, come on, say it. If it's finished, then it's done. And if it's finished, it's done in me. I am the recipient of what is finished. So as it is in heaven, that's how it is in me. Is that the truth? All right. Remember, the truth don't benefit you unless you mix it with faith. The gospel has no power in your life unless you mix it with faith. What's faith? Faith is believing according as it is written and speaking according as it is written. And as much as light within you, acting according as it is written. Amen? Truth. Truth applied brings manifestation. Not truth by itself. Truth applied brings manifestation. So if you don't have the truth, you're not in the race. But if you have the truth and you don't apply it, then you're going to lose the race. <laughs> Amen? So get the truth... And sell it not. Mix it with faith. Don't let any man steal your crown. Hallelujah. I like that. So having made peace and reconciliation through his cross, by him to do what? Reconcile 
all things unto himself. So this wayward, rebellious, threatening, miserable situation that is screaming at you. You could look at it and you could laugh and you could say the blood of his cross has already reconciled you. So I'm not going to allow you to dictate fear and anxiety and worry to me. Shut up. I'm serious. This is how it works. The Bible said there is none that quiet restore. The Bible speaks about Jesus doing some stuff with the rod of his mouth. Not being moved by a judging according to appearance, but judging righteously. Isaiah 4, chapter 11, verse 3, something somewhere there. Not judging according to what it looks like. It's what it looks like that is causing your fear and panic. But what does he do? He looked from where the truth of the, in the realm of God is and speak from there and with the rod in his mouth, silence the situation. Don't be intimidated by people, yourself, or situations, or anything else. God has given you a spirit of love and power and a sober, disciplined, sound mind. You are not to be intimidated by anything or anyone. Say this with me. I am not affected by anything or anyone. But by the life of Christ in me, I bring an effect. Are you with me? You got to talk like that. But then you see the Bible says, this is the boldness that you have when you awake to the reality that as he is, so are you. So you have boldness in the day of judgment. Because the love of God is perfected. I mean, how much better can it get? How great, how much better can the love get? Than God would exchange your life. Take your life with all of its misery, all of its shortcomings, all of its limitation. Just take it, end it, and give you the life of his son. And say, here, here, take my son. As he is, so are you. Now you go be him. <laughs> That's good. Say, I and him are one. Say it with me. We are one. No separation. No disconnect. As he is, so am I in this world. I have his love. I have his life. I have his name. I have his peace. I have his joy. And he is my strength. And he is in me wisdom. I can't lose. Greater is he that is in me. Than he that is in the world. If God is for me. Who can be against me? I believe. This is the truth. No weapon. Formed against me. Is going to prosper. None. No one. Why? This is my heritage. I silence every tongue. I shut up every voice. That rise up against me in judgment. I diffuse it of power. I bring it to naught. It is my heritage. I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm a son of God. I am righteous. He has given me his rights. Woo. Hallelujah. All right. Say no blockages. So just by the application of being dead to the rudiments of this world and all every situation being reconciled by the blood of his cross, you can stand in that place where I'm free. From all of these threatening circumstances. And you can look at it and say. Ha. Huh, you are but a light affliction. And you are going to work for me. A far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Because I'm not looking at you. I'm not magnifying you. You are but a molehill. But I'm looking on to him. The author. The finisher of my faith. I'm looking at the things that are not seen. And it's working within me. A far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. I'm counting it all joy in the midst of the test and trial because I know who I am, I know in whom I am believed, and I know what he has done. I'm in the place of truth. Truth prevails. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So blockages got to be removed. Why? So that the life can flow. So you've got to apply the death of Christ his crucifixion, what he did in his blood. You got to apply it to your life. How do you apply it? Well, remember in the Old Testament when they were asked to put the blood on the doorpost? Remember that? To come out of Egypt? What were they supposed to apply the blood with? Do you remember? With what? Come on, it's the right answer. Just say it loud. 
Let the devil hear it. <laughs> you apply the blood with hyssop. What was hyssop? It was like a, a kind of little weed somewhere. It was like grass. It's available everywhere. Everybody, it doesn't matter how poor you are, you had hyssop. Say, I got hyssop. <laughs> and with that hyssop, they would dip it in the blood and apply it over the doorpost. What's that hyssop a type of? It is a type of your mouth. Amen? So you apply the blood. You apply the sacrifice. You apply the death with what? Your mouth. Believe in your heart and say it with your mouth. That's how faith works. That's how you mix the gospel with faith. But without it, it's dead. That is, that is how you do it. It is the declaration of the truth of the cross that is the power of God unto us. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But then there are other blockages. We got emotional blockages. Envy, strife, unforgiveness, judgmental attitudes. Amen? And sometimes we simply just got to repent of them and get filled with the love of God. The Bible says where there's strife and there's confusion, there's every evil work, which means what? There's an open door to the enemy. And what is he there for? He is there to create the blockages so to stop the purpose of God in your life from coming forth. Whether it be a defined purpose on an individual basis, you're called to this or that or whatever, a vision, dream that God has placed in your heart that needs to be fulfilled, whether it be an individual purpose in that sense or whether it be the more general purpose, which is just the life and the nature of Christ manifesting through you, the devil wants to stop that purpose. So when he has access, he wants to plug up. He wants to plug you up so that that life in your spirit don't come out. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, that out of your heart are the issues, the springs of life. When you want to plug up those springs, he want to plug up those wells. And sometimes we got to repent. Sometimes we got to apply the sacrifice of Christ and so on. I'm not going to deal too much with the strife and the envy and all of those other stuff right now. But let's just, let's just, let's just say this. Let's just make a declaration right now. Let's just do something about these people that we need to get off of us. Let us do something about the us that we need to get off of us. Let us get rid of the me. Uh, is that okay? So close your eyes right now. And I say close your eyes because I want you to be reverent. I want you to, I want you to just stand before the Father God in his throne room and speak. I want you to declare this before heaven, declare this before earth, I declare, declare this to the host of angels, declare this to devils and demons. Say this with me. Say, Father, I judge that one died for all and that all were crucified with Christ. That's how I judge it. So I do not know anyone after the flesh. After what they say or what they do, the love of God is poured out of my life. It's flowing through my life. So I have no judgment against them. No retention of sin. No remembrance of the harm. I remit their sins by the authority of the blood of Christ. I release them, Father, into your hands. I release them by the power of the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name. They're gone. They're off of me. Thank you, Lord. You said, but they're the hurts. I got to deal with the hurts. The hurts, the, 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 the spirit, the, the animosity, these feelings, the hopelessness, the feeling of rejection and the, the, the other conflicting emotions. Feeling scorn and everything else. These emotions, they do have a voice. And they will give your senses a voice. They will cause your feelings to ascend. And, it, and in turn, at the end of it all, it will produce fear. That's going to be the end result. So then if you do not conquer 
the conflicts in your emotions. Hear me. If you do not con co conquer, overcome, deal with, get it under your feet, smother it, put the fire out. If you do not conquer your emotions and the hurts, emotions will move you. And you will end up living by them. And your senses will begin to speak loudly. Your feelings are going to begin to dominate you. And before you know it, it will result in fear. And what happens? That will block the flow of the anointing, the life that needs to flow. To those around you, those that need to be reached. They will hinder you also from experiencing the fulfillment of the promises of God that are yours. Their Christians go round and round and, and they're in it for a long time, 25 years, and, 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 and the same issues exist. They still, the promises are something afar off. They don't have the proof and the evidence and the experience of the fulfillment of the promises of God in their life that Jesus paid such a high price for them to experience. That's not right. Why not? Something is the problem. Something is blocking it. So when we don't deal with these things and they, 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 they plug us up and the life isn't able to flow, if the life can't flow to your spirit, how are you going to live in divine health? How are you going to live in divine health? You can't have somebody to lay hands on you all the time. They're not there all the time. Are you with me? You can't wait for the gifts of the Spirit, for a word of wisdom. and all. You can't do that. You need the life that is in you to be flowing continually, to drive off those things that you come in contact with just because you live here. Somebody's going to sneeze. Are you with me? You're going to be in an elevator, and all those people in the elevator was, 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 he was heading to that, to that clinic on the same floor that has to do with infectious diseases. And that you didn't even recognize that that's why they were all coughing. And you were in the elevator. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? You got to have that life flowing or else you're going to be at that clinic. Are you with me? But when that soul area is clogged up, that life don't flow. And that is just for your benefit, much less others. So we got to deal with it. Let's think about Jesus. Turn to me to Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus is always the answer. Whether it be, a, whether it be through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, his life, his blood, his name, his promises. He is always the answer. And the sacrifice of Christ is always the answer, no matter what it is. If you were just coming out of the Holocaust, you were coming out of that place of where there was such extreme um, um, decadence and, and such torture and such pain, and, you, and you've witnessed such extreme tragedy, the sacrifice of Christ is still the answer. Are you with me? Not only for that incurable disease that they call incurable, but for the emotional ones. For the person that is locked away and they, and, 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 and they put them in a straight jacket and they, they, the medical people say there is no hope. They're going to be this way for the rest of their life. They've me mentally they've lost it. The sacrifice of Christ is still the answer. Isaiah chapter 53. We're dealing with emotions. We're dealing with hurts. It Bible says in verse 3, talking about Jesus. He was despised. He was rejected of men. Despised. Rejected. Men of sorrows. Acquainted with griefs. We hid as it were our faces from him. Despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, etc. Jesus was ostracized, rejected, scorned, mocked. He was slapped, he was struck, he was afflicted, he was even crucified. But you know what? He did not yield to his feelings. He did not respond and act from that place. Because of that, Hebrews chapter 4, flip over there. Matter of fact, yeah, Hebrews chapter 2, let's pass this, this here in passing. Verse 18. 
So this Jesus has went through it all that experience ever heard that you could ever experience. He walked through it. He himself, it says in verse 18, suffered being tempted and he is able to succor. He is able to run to the aid and he is able to rescue and deliver you in the midst of all your hurt and all your pain. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 that we have such a high priest which cannot, Jesus the high priest, say Jesus the high priest. Say it again. One more time. Now the reason I'm having you say that is because I want you to know that that's the office that Jesus is functioning right now. Amen? All this other stuff he already did, but right now that's what he's doing in heaven. Functioning in that office. Living to make intercession. Ministering to you the life and the power of God as you stand on his word. Ministering healing and deliverance. We have such a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. What is that talking about? Jesus experienced all of your pain, your feelings, your infirmities, your weaknesses, your fears, and it touches him. But he did not succumb to them. He knows how to deliver you out to them. He can, put it this way, he can heal your feeler. You know what a feeler? Call it a feeler. That stuff that feels stuff. Right? He can heal your feeler. So what should you do? Go to the one that can fix it. Right? Go to him. He's the one that can heal. You see, your mind and your heart, your mind is sensitive. Your mind was never designed by God to live underneath the stress and the pain and the hurt and the woundedness that happens just because, because of Adam's fall in this world. You were never designed for that. So God wants you to free, be free from it. Without a show of hands, how many of you would say, hey, look, you know what? I've got some hurts. I've got some wounds. I've got some rejection. I've got a little bit of this. I've got some of that. Some of that stuff has affected me, and I want to be free from it. That you would say that to the Lord, not to me. Lord, I want to be free. I want to be totally free. Well, I want you to let's pray this prayer together. And again, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Not, the Bible says watch and pray, and I know that. All right? But I want you to be, I want you to be, you can watch with your eyes closed and just be watching for the Spirit of God. <laughs> Amen? I want you to be reverent. That's why. Because we're, we're believing for the ministry and the power of the, of the living Christ to come and manifest himself to you. Don't be, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid to trust him. Don't be afraid to yield to him. Don't be afraid to give him your hurts. Don't be afraid to obey him. Because on the other side of, of obedience is the fulfillment of the promises of God. Say this with me. Say, Father, you know my heart. You know my life. You know where I have been. And you know all that has happened in my life. You know the rejection. You know the pain. You know the divorce. You know the fears. You know the abandonment. You know the discouragement. The disappointment, the anxiety. You know what I face. You know what I feel. You know what I have done, what I have said. You know my failures. You know me. You're the only one on earth that knows me like you do. But you said I can be free. You said whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You said I can be free from the effect of every feelings. Jesus, you said you are touched by those things that touch me. Jesus, you were tempted in every point, but you were without sin. You know what I feel right now. And I give you my feelings. I give you my hurts. Heal my healer. Heal my feeler. Let the spirit of grace help me. I come boldly to your throne to obtain mercy, to obtain grace. I'm free from condemnation. I receive your spirit of grace. To overcome my feelings of fear and anxiety, fear of the future, torment from the past. 
I come to you, Jesus. I receive your help. I ask for your anointing to break the yokes from off of my life. Spirit of grace, Spirit of God, my helper, come to my aid in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now why are we dealing with bondages? Why do we have to get it off of us? Here is why. How many of us have a garden hose? Behind that garden hose, which is in our heart, there is just an abundance of the power, the life, the glory, the joy. We are filled with the fullness of God. But how much of that life and power comes out is dependent on the nozzle. Are you with me? And that nozzle could be shut completely. And even though that power is in there, no power is coming out. Or you can open the nozzle a little bit. Or you can open the nozzle a, lo a lot. The issue about the blockages is to open up the nozzle. You see, how much power, how much of the life of God you enjoy that you walk in that flows out of you is determined by that nozzle. There is no shortage of power. There's no shortage of life and healing. It is about that nozzle. So that's why we've got to deal with it. And when we are able to deal with it and get rid of those blockages and have a free conscience, then we are able to function more effectively in the authority of righteousness. And then what happens? We become bold as a lion. What people think don't affect us. What the circumstances say don't move us. And we can be bold in the day of judgment. And as the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 4, Remember when it was talking about that power that flows through you that is able to affect people? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 4. No, oh, this is in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 3 and verse 4 it says, But we are confident in the Lord touching people because of his power that flows out of us. That ye will do, that that person will do, and will do that which we command. Most of the times we don't have the boldness and the confidence to be able to command somebody and say, you know what, you need to repent. You need to come to the Lord. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that you and your household could be saved. You need to receive this. You need to start. We don't have that. that we don't feel we have that authority to speak that way into people's lives. Come pray with me. Let's pray right now. We say, would you like to pray? And, our, and, our, and there's no authority. There is no power. But here it talks about commanding. No, you don't just command for command's sake, but when, the, when you hear it from the Lord, you can command. Amen? But when you, don't have, when you have all these blockages, you don't hear properly. You have all these strongholds, imaginations, high things, blocking the wisdom of God and the voice of God. Amen? But what happens when we get this freedom? We can operate in this authority of righteousness. And the life of Christ can come forth. And he can make every knee bow and every tongue confess. Amen? We're going to stop here for now. Lord willing, next week we're going to go and see how we can be in that position to hear his voice. And to get a hold of the wisdom that is from above. Not the one that is earthly, based on reason. Not the one that is sensual, based on our lust. Not the one that is devilish with the enemy, with the devil and demons tormenting and, and bringing frustration and condemnation and accusation. No, not those. But where you can be in position for the wisdom of God. Where you can be in position because we are his sheep and we hear his voice. And hear his voice. And get that divine utterance so that you know what to speak in situations. So that you can go into an environment of unbelief. You can go into an environment where someone has been so hard and harsh against God for so long, and you could take authority over that environment. So that now the devils and demons that were binding their mind, keeping them in darkness, has to be removed, have to step back. And so that the life and the spirit of God could flow and touch them. So that we can reach the lost. 
so that we can know that they are in our inheritance, reach our family members, what we need to know to reach them. We've got to reach our families. We've got to reach our neighbors. We've got to reach our co-workers. Co we have got to stop the enemy in his assault and allow the life of Christ to come and sub bring subjection and bring salvation to people. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen? Does this make sense to you? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's stand. Lembo rosu kodabasha takatabaya. Halakam. Say this with me. I receive the ministry of the Lord today. I receive it. People are released off of me. I am released off of me. Situations are silenced. People have remitted people's sins. The hurts are released. Jesus, my healer, is in the house. Thank you, Lord, for your power that removes the blockages, sets me free so that your life can flow and that I can experience the fulfillment of your promises and the, benefit of, of my, the benefits of my salvation, the very life and nature of Christ, in me, flowing through me. In Jesus' name, amen.